welcome to this presentation in which we're going to cover uh, some of the uh, rules of the road in terms of how to use Microsoft Word and the particular formatting issues that are important for legal work and also are just kind of important specifically for this class. I've opened up a particular assignment. You can see at the top there are two sections here that are in bright colored font. The first is it reminds you that you need to look at the comments that I have submitted from previous assignments. About two-thirds of students uh, consistently look at the comments that I provide and once they get a comment once or twice they stop doing whatever that thing is and then their grades go up and the, the bottom line is is that you can do almost anything once and uh, as long as you stop doing it once you read the comment you're going to be great in the course this is uh, in many senses an easy a because I tell you exactly what to do and you just need to do it but there's a group of students who I think probably don't read their comments and perhaps in some cases it's that they don't know how to find the comments. So going forward, I'm going to require that you actually cut and paste your comments into your comment section. And that way I can know that you at least found them and you had the opportunity to read them. And if you don't paste them, that probably tells me this student would benefit from a little bit more support in the how to find the comments. In an online course, it's sometimes hard for me to tell what students are, are understanding what to do. They're just too busy and, and don't get to it. Okay, that happens, that's life, versus the student who really ha has the time and wants to excel but doesn't know how to excel. And so um, this is hopefully going to help me and help you uh, get the information that you need so that we, I can make sure that you are uh, set up for success. So let's assume that you're doing this assignment and you want to go and see what the comments are that I have provided for previous assignments. How do you find those comments? Will you go to your grades? Now obviously your grades won't say grades for test student. It'll say if your name is Mary Smith, grades for Mary Smith. You go into the grades tab and then you'll see information that looks pretty similar to this. When you see a grade, in this case you can see that this student got a 5 out of 5. Um, there aren't any comments here. You can click on this. Oh, actually there is a comment here. Uh, test Okay, test student scores are not included in grade statistics, so I don't think that's actually a comment. But you can see down here where they have the little conversation bubble, that means that there is a comment. Now, I am not a student in the class, obviously, and so I don't, what mine looks like may be a little bit different than what yours looks like. So if when you're looking at this, you think, gosh, mine doesn't look anything like this, come visit my office hours and we can work together to find what you're seeing to make sure that you're getting the comments. But let's look at an example here. I'm going to look into practice assignment not for grade. You can see I got a quote unquote grade of one out of, out of one and then there's this little conversation bubble. When I click on that I'm going to get this comment. I think this this the right document. I think that this document is correct. So there's actually two comments that I've submitted here. Let's look at this next one. I have one here for the first discussion board. I got zero out of 10 for this one. I click on this, and this is the comment that I posted for this test student. Here is an example of a comment. If this comment were for a real student, it would likely include codes like blah, 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 blah. So this is what you would cut and paste and put in the comment section when you submit your assignment. And this lets me know that at least you found the codes. You may or may not have looked up to see what those codes are. Let's just see though how I actually see what codes are. So now I'm going to go to home and I'm going to make it look like a student's. And I'm going to go down to teacher comments for email assignment. This will become visible after this. you have completed the assignment and I, the instructor, have posted your grade. You'll be able to see the comments. So you'll look at your comment section to find the codes and then you'll look here. Oh, and look, if you had a three on your comment code, this comment applies to you. 
Some students omitted one or more of the emails. This omission resulted in a six-point deduction. So that's going to tell you, oh, that's what I did wrong. Let's say you had code eight. Some students left off the colon after dear blank blank. So this helps you figure out what you did wrong. If you get something wrong, it's not a big deal. It's one point. There's going to be hundreds and hundreds of points in this course. So please don't focus on whether you missed a point here or didn't miss a point there. The important thing is that whatever the error is, that you don't repeat it. And so when you see a deduction, that's really my way of kind of uh, nudging you and saying, hey, I want you to really notice this. And so instead of saying, oh gosh, I missed a point, how stupid of me, or I'm so disappointed, or something along those lines, think to yourself, my teacher just kind of nudged me in the shoulder to say, hey, please notice this, because if you get this fixed, you're going to have an amazing document next time. And so this is my way of kind of getting your attention. So a loss of a point, not a big deal. The important thing is that you're not going to do that next time. So here would be the comments. So you don't have to copy this and put this in your comment section. You would just do that eight or that three that were, was listed in your grade comment section. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Let me go back to here. So when I say cut and paste the comments from your last document assignment, that's where you would cut and paste that dis description and um, put that in your comment section. If you're not sure how to do this, go ahead and visit me during my office hours and I will be glad to set it up for you the first time uh, so that you'll know exactly how to do it. I realize this sometimes is a new process and it may take a couple of times for you to get the gist of it. That's why I'm here. I ought to be a resource for you. If you go the whole semester and never come to my office hours, either you're really tremendously good at this and our brains are really aligned in almost a freakish way, or you've missed an opportunity. This is hard stuff in terms of, I mean, the work itself is easy. Uh, it's just a matter of tabbing and spacing and doing stuff like that. But communicating all of these details, there's a lot of stuff to do. And so a person who tries to do it on his or her own is probably going to stumble a little bit. Uh, you're going to find that you save yourself a lot of time and frustration if you just say, hey, you know what? Groover's there. Just call it during office hours. Get this this thing that I've been worrying about for the last 30 minutes, get it squared away in about, you know, 30 seconds. Uh, because most of the time there's a super quick answer and the student says, oh my gosh, <laughs> that was so easy. I was overthinking this or I misread this or Groover didn't explain it as clearly as she did when we were talking. So don't hesitate. In fact, plan every week for a time, okay, if I need Groover this week, this is the time I'm going to stop by. Obviously, you're going to have to have your document assignments ready for me at that time, so you're going to have to plan your week so that you're going to be able to do that. And if it ends up you don't have any questions, don't come by or come by anyway and we can just chat. Um, and when I say come by, of course, for many of us, it's going to be a virtual come by, a telephone call, a coming to my virtual office hours. Either one of those is great. It can be super, super quick. Sometimes I have students say, well, I work during those times. Well, my guess is you take a lunch break. Maybe that day you take an early lunch break or a late lunch break. And even if you don't have a lunch break, perhaps you've got a 15-minute break where you can maybe go to the ladies' room or men's room or something like that. Why don't you use that time for this purpose? Um, since it's just once a week, my guess is most employers would be okay with you taking 10 minutes off, maybe at a time that isn't your usual time. Um, if it truly is the case that you are in a working environment that you just don't have that luxury, then we can work out an alternative time where we can meet. There isn't a reason not to meet with me if I can provide benefits. We'll figure something out. The only thing you're going to have to do is plan ahead and make sure, hey, wait a second, um, the assignment may be due on Sunday night, but I'm going to have to get it done on Wednesday or Thursday, or at least get it pretty close to done so that I can talk to Groover about it. That's the, the part that uh, is a little bit planning ahead oriented on your part.
Okay, so I'm done with my spiel. I just wanted to alert you to the fact that you do need to cut and paste those comments in the uh, 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 comment section of your assignment. Okay, let's go to our next item. I have some examples of documents. I'm going to look at this one. We're going to look at this one first. I'm going to put on this paragraph. You see this, this backwards P paragraph sign. This is the way, actually this isn't exactly the way your caption ought to look because you ought not be using, um, you know, just have space. If you want more than one space, if you, if you want, if you're going to hit the space bar more than twice in a row, go ahead and use the tab button. Okay, and you can see here though, up here, I'm just looking at this part of the assignment, we don't have any space uh, oh, buttons that we don't need. I've taken away those last ones. This is a nicely formatted caption. We can see that this is centered. How can I see it? Well, I go look over here and I see that it's a centering area. We can see that um, we've tabbed over to give us a section sign. Because we're tabbing, they're gonna line up perfectly. If we started doing spaces here, it's gonna look a little bit wiggly wobbly. Um, we're going to tab over to indent the plaintiff and the defendant. Um, we're going to tab these over. The only time we hit the space bar is between words or between sentences. That's really the only time we need the space bar. Otherwise, we're going to be using the tab button. And the tab button, again, is right above the caps lock button, and it probably says on your keyboard TAB. The space bar, as you know, is that long bar. Um, it's right below the C through the uh, comma bar. So it actually takes up about, I guess, six um, uh, letter uh, squares on your keyboard, and it's directly below that. Um, you can see here this particular uh, person to the space bar there, they should have done the tab there. So there were some problems here. But in terms of this caption, it's perfect. Now, sometimes what happens in student submissions is that they're working from a model. And models are awesome to work from. You will do that so many times in your career. It makes your life so much easier. But the first time you take a model, it's almost more work than it is that you're saving, or at least it can be, because you have to clean it up. The person who created the model may have some bad habits. They may have, you know, used the space bar here randomly or they may have used the space bar here or something like that and so you do need to spend just a couple of minutes getting it cleaned up uh, it doesn't take long as long as you turn on this paragraph sign you're going to be able to go through quickly and see all of the formatting stuff there doesn't seem to be a lot here that needs to be done we're good to go and now you're ready to save it and then to go ahead and, and clean it up. Uh, so uh, realize whenever you're using a model, you're going to have to check for things like space bars and uh, fonts and things along those lines to make sure that you've cleaned it up. One of the things that you're likely to do when you are dealing with a, a model that maybe isn't something you've created is you're probably going to go over here and hit select all. So what you do is you go over to your um, right most part you're under the home uh, choice and then you go over here hit select and then hit select all it's going to highlight the whole document but you'll notice it doesn't highlight the footer and i don't think it highlights a header either so i'm going to go in and i'm going to uh, change the the ta the, the uh, font i changed it to calibri i'm going to change it back to times new roman and I see it's 12 point. I'm going to change it to 12 point. So I'm thinking my document's good. I hit select all and now everything is great. Well, that command does not fix our footer. Our footer we can see is Calibri still. We don't want that. So we're going to have to go into our uh, footer and manually make that change even though this told us select all it lied it really wasn't select all and so you'll want to manually go in and change this I'm also going to go and add a page number because we always need in our footers to have the name of the document and the page number 
So I'm going to hit insert and page number. I'm going to go to current position. I think it's better to do page blank of however many total pages there are. And so now I have a lovely uh, example of this. I'm going to click out of this and you'll see that down here my font is going to be okay. I can always check it to see Times New Roman. It's 11 point. You could do 10, you could do 12, whatever you prefer here. And it says page two of page of two pages. So the important things to remember about footers are you're going to have to separately change the font and you're going to have to add both the name and the page number. So those are some important things to keep in mind with your documents. Sometimes students like, to, if the document has uh, two or more document, excuse me, the document assignment is two or more documents. So the students like to submit a single document. Um, so they will have a, a, maybe a cover memo or a cover letter followed by a court pleading or court uh, filing of some type. It's fine to have those as one document if you would like. I don't think most law firms would do it that way, but it's fine for the purpose of this class if you want to. I will tell you though that having two having a single document is going to be harder work for you. And so my suggestion in the kind of the spirit of let's make things easier rather than harder is to do the two documents. The reason it's going to be harder is that you're going to have to have two different footers. You'll have to have one footer for the first document. Maybe that's the, the memo um, or maybe it's the cover letter. And again, you might even just omit a, a, a footer, I'm assuming a, a footer for that document entirely. But when you get to the court paper, you'll need to have a footer with the document name and you'll need to have the page number. But if you have the cover letter in front of it, well then this won't start at page one, it'll start at page two. Well, that's not okay. You can't do that on a court paper. So you might say, well, I'll put my cover letter at the end. And in a way that's better because your page, your pagination will be okay, but it will, your first page will be okay, but it will exaggerate the number of your total pages because it will be counting your cover letter as one of the pages. So when the clerk is going through the document, she'll say, wait a second, this document only has two pages, but you're saying it has three pages. So that's not a good thing. Plus it means your cover letter will say page three of three. Well, the cover letter is its own thing, so it should be just one page. So, is it possible to have more than one footer, more than one series of pagination? Yes, it is. You can do that. It's hard. And so, my philosophy is why make something hard when it doesn't have to be? Just create two documents. That's, the, that's a lazy person's solution to this problem. But again, if you want to, to research how to do that um, and create one document, that is perfectly fine with me. Just be aware it's not okay that you have the wrong name of the document in a footer or that you have the wrong total number of pages or the wrong number of page for this particular document. So again, another kind of important thing to keep in mind. Let's talk about this section here. I happen to have this in what's called left justification, or they call it a line left here. And that means that there's going to be a sharp edge here and what they call a ragged edge over here. If I were to center everything, this is gonna look really strange, it would look like this, right? Nobody does that. If I were to do this, nobody does this either, um, at least not, in for a paragraph section they, they might do this for the uh, the mode of delivery or or some other item in, in a particular category on a letter but you wouldn't do it for a paragraph within a letter and you can see here it's just kind of the reverse of this because this time this is the sharp edge and then this is the ragged edge so this is the left justification is a good choice there are plenty of legal professionals who prefer this choice, which is called full justification. And this justification, this is a sharp edge, and this is a sharp edge. Now this isn't completely sharp because if the paragraph, and most paragraphs aren't gonna end with the number of, of spaces being exactly 
uh, aligned up here. But this is going to look for all but your last paragraph, I mean your last, last line in your paragraph to look pretty sharp. And so this is how it looks. Let me just make the paragraph thing go away. This looks the way a book looks. When you read a book, you <coughs> most, most books and magazine articles and new paper, newspapers are going to be fully justified. Uh, some people like this look, think, think this look looks good. The problem with this look is that there, in order to have this be a sharp edge and to have this be a sharp edge, the, um, the, um, the author had to do a little bit of fancy work here. So here, here's an example of how it looks when uh, you have a really long word here. And so these word letters have to be kind of super stretched out. And so the space between this ampersand and the M is quite a bit bigger than the space between this Y and this O. Um, so it can create lines that look weird. It can also look great. Lines that look great. Um, so that's kind of, a, I don't say a judgment call because most people either hate full justification or hate left justification. And it kind of turns on, do you find this really awful looking or do you find the ragged edge really awful looking? Um, I happen to like the left justification. That's me. But if you prefer this or you work in a law firm that prefers this, um, I'm not going to say it's wrong. There's definitely people out there who prefer this and uh, for the purposes of our class, if you prefer it, uh, I'm not going to count off for it. Um, you do need to be consistent if you decide that this paragraph is going to be fully justified. All of your paragraphs have to be fully justified. So, but you do need to know that vocabulary so that when you're talking about a document and somebody tells you, be sure to left justify, you know what they mean. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about this caption. This is an effective caption. I like this. This is going to work. Let me show you one that isn't as effective. It looks the same. Let me get rid of this underlining. It looks the same. When I look at this, it looks very similar to the uh, document that we were just looking at here. And in terms of the various rules of the road that I have, this actually, this looks a little bit wobbly here. Looks like maybe it's um, not exactly lined up. So I'm suspicious that there may be some uh, spaces here. But other than that, it looks pretty good. Let me, let's review, reveal the formatting so we can see. Ah, yes, I was right. There is some wobbliness because what this particular person has done is hit the space bar lots of times. When I hit the space bar, you can get a couple of different signs. You can get that big zero looking thing like this. Or if I hit the space bar, you can get these periods, these little dots in the middle. They're not periods because they're halfway up the line. When I hit a tab, let me just do a tab down here, it's typically going to look, so now I'm hitting the tab button, it's typically going to look like an arrow in. Sometimes what will happen is that this will actually move. And so you, you'll, you, the, the computer kind of knows that you want to uh, tab in and so it'll actually, instead of giving you that little um, arrow sign, it will um, give you a, uh, um, it, it will um, act like, uh, it will do this instead, it will go like that. And so it will move it in, but it won't have the arrow simply because it's moved this thing forward. You can see there's some problems here with this one. This a student didn't get rid of the spaces. So we're going to do that for him or her. And elsewhere looks pretty good. Um, didn't need to do this. I'm not sure what was going on here. Okay. Okay, looks fine. So, um, 
what is the problem here? What is going wrong with the student that she or she did all these spaces? Well, the problem is that when I hit the tab button here, look what happens. It doesn't tab. What's going on here? Well, it's because this particular student has set this up as a table. Um, and when you have a table format, it doesn't allow the person who is working with the table to tab. There are ways of setting up captions as tables that avoid this problem. Um, it is possible to do it. I'm not going to show you how because it's a lot harder. And again, my, my little song and dance is let's make things easier rather than harder. And typically when you do these types of captions, you, you aren't going to redo a caption every single time. You're going to set up one caption and then you're going to do that caption over and over and over again. And so, you know, when you set up that first caption, you know, you're going to spend a little bit more time getting it formatted the way you want it because you want to save yourself, you know, for the next hundred times that you do a caption, you're going to save yourself a significant amount of time. And so, you know, maybe instead of, you know, making the caption in five minutes, you do the caption in 10 minutes and you're going to save yourself time going forward. So here, if I wanted to space this away from the caption, and, and I would want to, you can see how that doesn't look the best. My only choice is the space bar because of how I set things up. But that's not a very good solution. So instead of having this as a table, I'm going to restart this and do it like this with the tabbing. So it looks like this. So keep in mind, we don't want to do a table. We want to do uh, with the tab key. You may find some of the models that we use in this course do have a table for the caption. Um, again, the, the examples that we use in this class are good starting points. They show you how things ought to look, but they are intentionally designed to uh, create opportunities for you to correct the work of the model. So be on the lookout for that. Okay, so when we indent paragraphs, we're not going to do this. We're not going to do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, whatever you'd want to do. Instead, we're going to hit the tab button. Now we can set our tabs for whatever we want. Let's say we think, gosh, we'd like a, a bigger tab than this. We want it to be all the way over here. Guess what? We can do that. We can set our tabs for whatever we want. Um, Let's say we wanted it over there. We could do that too. We control that. Um, the space bar is really, it's got two problems. First of all, it just spaces a tiny amount. And it gets to be really hard counting up all of these little spaces. But the bigger problem with the space bar isn't that it takes a long time and it's hard to remember how many spaces. It's that it will not line up perfectly. Um, if there's anything in front of it. And so um, that's how you get that wobbly line here. You can see now this is nicely lined up as opposed to that wobbly looking example we had before. So the tab key is easier to use and it makes your documents look nicer. So just be sure when you're using a model or whatever that you turn on the, uh, the reverse paragraph sign and go through and get rid of all the spaces. The only places that you want spaces are between words and between sentences. In any other place you just go ahead and remove them is the secret to that. Okay, so uh, let's go to our next item. One thing that Microsoft Word likes to do is superscript dates. Let's see here. So let's say that I were typing up this date. I'm going to type May 12th. And let's say I wanted to do May 12th, 2019. Well, it will superscript. And when I say superscript, let me go in a little bit here means it will make the writing small and put it up higher. That's why we saw it, call it super, because it's higher. 
Um, first of all, we don't want to have this TH within a date. May 12, 2019 is how we want to do dates. So if we just type May 12, 2019, we don't even have to worry about the superscripting phenomenon, right? So as long as you don't type the TH, you're not going to have to worry about the, the TH bouncing up here. That's not a good look. It's not a professional look. But um, remember that if for some reason you did want the TH here, we don't want it to superscript. Uh, there are some secrets to how to avoid superscripting. Here's an example of a situation where you can have superscripting. Um, this court is 199th. Um, what you don't want, you can either capitalize the TH or make it a lowercase TH, whichever you prefer. But what you don't want to do is you don't want to superscript it. And so you're going to want to either do the TH, but at the end of the TH, don't hit the space bar. So once I'm done, see my cursor is blinking, I'm going to go somewhere else and start typing. If I'm right here and I hit the space bar, let me go back and type it. If I have TH and I hit the space bar right now, it's going to superscript. Watch this. Oh, it didn't. Why did it not? Now it's going to do it. No, it's not. I don't know why it's not doing it now. Let me start from scratch here. I'm, I'm mystified by this. Let me go into the other example and maybe we can get it to happen here. Okay, so here we have the 199th and I'm going to hit the space bar and it superscripts. That's again what we don't want to have happen. So the way to avoid it is after you type the H in the TH is to not hit the space bar. I already have that space bar in there and it will stay lower um, uh, a normal font. A couple of other points I wanted to make while we're looking at this is you always want to provide um, four to five areas where the person can sign. Now, I don't know Throckmorton Miller. He may have a very small signature, but he may also have a big signature. You're going to know the signature size of your attorney. I can see here it's one, two, three, four. We've, we've provided four spaces. That is abundant space for a signature. You want to provide at least two. So you definitely would not want to have um, let me just move this up here so we can see what this looks like. This would be the absolute minimum amount of space. And you'd only provide this limited amount of space is if um, you, you were really trying to get everything on one page and it was just difficult to do so. Um, and so that would be kind of like a, a worst case scenario situation. Let's look at spacing between lines. I'm going to go over here. We're in the paragraph. We're in the home section. We're in the paragraph section. And we're going to look at line spacing. So we go here. You can do either one, uh, one uh, or single spaced or single space with 1.15. You want to have these two showing as add space before. If you um, don't do that, what'll happen if you if you actually have it, let me just click on it so we can see, is it will automatically, whenever you have this return or enter button, it will automatically put an extra space in. Now you may well want that space many times, but you don't want that space here. And so you constantly have to be playing around with this to remove it. It's better when to have it read add space, add space. And that way, when I do want another space, I just do that. I have greater control in this situation. I'm not fighting the formatting. Um, so you want to have it either one times or 
one five times and make sure that these read add space before paragraph, add space after paragraph. There will be some times where you may want to have it one and a half space or two space. I'm not saying those aren't good choices, but you always want to control these so that it's not telling you when it when it's or it's not making you or forcing you to have an extra space that you don't want to have um, in your formatting. Sometimes uh, students want to add the signature. It is true that in this world of electronic signatures, where virtually everything is electronically filed, you're probably going to do the signature like this. It's the, 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 the margins are so weird because we have it on full justification. That's what happens when you do this. Okay, so I have his signature. I don't want to enter this, and, and I'm going to need to have this. This is how many uh, clerks uh, do the electronic signature. Um, I don't want to, to format this, though, until... until um, Throgmorton Miller has said, I'm ready to sign it. You know, in the days where uh, documents were filed uh, via paper, Throgmorton Miller would actually have gotten out his pen and signed it. And then you would know, okay, he has formally said this is ready to go. That's your indication. So when you type this in, it's the same thing as Throgmorton Miller saying, I'm ready to sign it. In our class, when you submit it to me, it's like you're submitting it to Throgmorton Miller. You're saying to him, I think this is ready to go, but you know, look it over and tell me and make any changes you need. So therefore, it's not time for the signature. Throgmorton Miller hasn't told you it's good to go. Once you get it back from him and he says, oh, no changes are necessary, then that's when you um, would put in the electronic signature. Sometimes folks will want to uh, take a signature, a fancy signature, like this, again, kind of finding the, um, and, and they, they go up here and they try to find a, a font that is, you know, pretty or looks like handwriting or something. When people are going for electronic signatures, they're not going for this. Um, that's not what an electronic signature means. It's not a signature that is made to look like an a electronic signature or like a real signature. So that, so please don't do that. That is creating the impression that Throgmorton Miller actually did sign it. I mean, it's not a very good replication of his likely signature, but, um, you can see here too, sometimes people will do this kind of dotted line signature. Um, that's not going to work. We need to have a solid line for the signature. Oops, here we go. Oops, I'm hitting the wrong button. So you want it to look like a solid line across the bottom. Here we actually have two lines. I don't know that we need that. Okay, so you want to have that one line. And the way that I do that is I hit shift and then I hit the button to the um, right of the zero. And that's what gets you this solid line. You don't want the, the line that looks like this. 
looks like almost Morse code or something, little in dashes. Um, there are purposes for that line, but it's not to create a signature line. Let me see if there are any other items that I wanted to be sure to cover. Um, we don't have a letter set up here, uh, but if, if we were writing a letter to somebody, um, let me just do another, here we go, let me start a new page. We would have a space for the letterhead. Now in our class, we've been pretending that the letterhead is a, um, a part of the document um, that we actually type up. In most cases, you're going to have actually pre-printed letterhead. Um, it would be unusual for a law firm to kind of be that cheap, to be honest with you, that they would actually have it printed up. So usually what you would do is just tab down several lines, recognizing that you're going to feed letterhead paper in to, to put the letterhead up here. And so now, uh, you're going to leave this blank where the letterhead's going to go, and now you're going to put in the date. A really common thing that students continue to do this semester is they want to center the date. Now, that instinct isn't wrong, but you want it to be about the middle of the page. Let's just see where the middle of the page is. So I'm going to hit center for a second. So the center of the page is right here at the, um, the, the three inch part. And so what I'm, and if I were to, to type up, let me just do this, let me, so if I were to, to type up the date, so I'm going to do June 14, 2020. Notice I did not do June 14th. So now you can see, well, gosh, it looks like it starts at about uh, two and three quarters and it ends about um, three and three quarters. So now I could use that information, go back here to my left tab, and go over here, tab, 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 tab. And I could either pick this point or that point. Either one's fine. I could set up a new tab if I wanted to. I could decide I'm going to, I really want it to be exactly the center. Um, I'm probably going to go with this one, but either one's fine. And I'm going to type it in. This is how we do the approximate centering of the date. We don't do this. We don't hit the center button. We do this. The reason that we don't do the center button is that we want this J to line up perfectly with the very bottom of our letter. I'm just going to skip all the content, which is going to start very truly yours. I'm going to give again four or five returns. Cynthia Groover Paralegal. I want all of these to line up. So this is right at the three point, three inch point. The V is right at the three inch point. The C is right at the three inch point. The P is right at the three inch point. This lines up beautifully. If I center this, there is no way I'm going to be able to line this up at all easily. You could say, well, why don't you just center all the rest of these? Well, the problem with that is that each one of these items has differing links, and so it'll look like this. I mean, none of us sees letters that look like this. This isn't the way that people put together letters. So everyone kind of knows that I need to, um, you know, tab this one in. But for whatever reason, people want to do the, um, the date differently. Um, just don't. It doesn't look good. And it, it is a, 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 a kind of a telltale sign of somebody who, who doesn't know how to put together a professional letter. Um, you can, if, if you can't see this line here, um, you can turn on the grid. And sometimes it's a little easier to catch. Um, or you can print the letter and fold it and actually see it a little bit easier. So that's why you don't center the date. 
Let me see if there's anything else. Again, a reminder about how we do the salutation. It's going to always start with dear. Then you're going to use Ms. or Mr. Or if it's a judge, you're going to do honorable. Or if it's a doctor, you're going to do doctor. Uh, there could be some others, other honorifics, but these are the main ones. Then you're going to have a space, and you're going to have the person's last name. And then you're going to do a colon. Now, if you are writing to your Aunt Mabel, you aren't going to do a colon. You're going to do a comma for personal correspondence. But you wouldn't use personal correspondence on law firm letterhead. So you're always going to use a colon. And a colon is one dot over another dot. You have to hit shift. This is the button, the, the key uh, to the uh, right of L. And you hit shift to make that, that key. So you're going to have, let's say this is Susan Brown. So it would be Dear Ms. Brown. Let's say you happen to know Susan is married. We don't use Mrs. Brown unless we have a reason to think that Susan prefers that. If she sent us correspondence where she said Mrs. MRS, then you would use Mrs. If she's filled out a form, maybe you actually request your clients to indicate a preference. Then, of course, you're going to honor her preference. Most women prefer MS, period. And in many cases, you won't know the marital status of the woman, and so it would be presumptuous of you to, to guess and even if you did know, that may, that may be information that she considers irrelevant to whatever the issue is. So MS is the safe choice, what you want to use uh, probably 95% of the time. If you're dealing with a very, very senior person, maybe somebody in, in her 70s or 80s, uh, you might consider using Mrs. if you really think that's what she would prefer, even though you're not 100% sure. But it would be rare for somebody who wasn't of a retirement age that you would use Mrs. Unless, again, you had some reason to think that she would prefer that. So use MS period as the fallback position. Let's say you're writing a letter to someone named Pat Brown or Chris Brown, and you don't know whether Pat is a man or a woman. And so under those circumstances, you could use Dear Pat Brown. That's less than ideal because it is a little bit jarring for the person to receive that. But it's better to do that than to guess Ms. Brown when, in fact, it's Mr. Brown. So you're kind of avoiding the, the, the bad situation where you misidentify somebody in terms of gender. So if you're uh, dealing with somebody perhaps from a different culture or who has a name that can be of other, either gender, go ahead and write out the first and the last name. Let's see if there's anything else. Oh, sometimes I get questions about what should I use for a signature block? There's really two choices that are good. Uh, the other choices I would say pass on. They are very truly yours and sincerely. Um, I find sincerely yours okay, but you don't want to use regards or, sorry, best regards. These are not good ones. Cross them out. Another thing you don't want to do in a letter is say respectfully submit it. This is only appropriate in a, a court filing because you aren't submitting a letter, you're mailing a letter. And so you aren't filing it with the court. So for letters, we don't do respectfully submitted. Court filings, we do routinely use respectfully submitted. Another difference is that when you're doing a letter, you don't have a signature line. So I'm not going to put here, a line for me to sign. Whether it's the attorney who's signing it or I'm signing it or whatever, there is no line that goes in a letter. But in a court filing, and by the way, 
um, well, here we have, in, in this particular one, we do need a line. So court filings, you need a line. Letters, you don't need a line. One last thing, we don't want to use contractions. Um, uh, of course, contractions are words that um, are the combination of two words. So it is, the contraction for it is would be its. Or um, is not would be isn't. These are not grammatically incorrect, but they're too formal for legal writing. The only time you'll see them in legal writing is when they're part of a quote. And we don't change quotes as long as they're within the, the quotation marks. That would be uh, uh, misrepresenting a particular quote. That would be an ethical lapse. So that's the only time that you typically see uh, contractions. Uh, there are some legal writers who do use them. Uh, occasionally uh, because it does kind of reflect a more spoken style of English uh, but for a paralegal to take that initiative is just not a good idea the general rule is no contractions and I definitely do take off if students take contractions now that doesn't mean that you won't use apostrophes um, there are lots of times if we're referring to um, mr. Brown's office this apostrophe s is not a contraction it is a, a, the possessive form this is referring to the office that belongs to mr. Brown so you still will have apostrophes but you'll just restrict them to the situation typically where you have possessive I hope that this information has been helpful for you I thank you so much for your attention and have a wonderful day